Hello, I'm Dr. Randall Seacrest, your host for eOrthopod TV. Today I have as a guest Professor Angus Wallace from the University of Nottingham. Uh, today we'll be talking about shoulder arthroplasty. Uh, good afternoon, Dr. Wallace. Good afternoon, Dr. Seacrest. Professor Wallace, what I thought we would talk about today is, is a procedure that I understand that you're an expert on called shoulder arthroplasty. And for patients that are watching, uh, shoulder arthroplasty refers to artificial replacement of the shoulder. So what I thought we would talk about first is a little bit about the procedure and the conditions that the procedure is used for. Um, why would a patient uh, come to you for a shoulder arthroplasty? What disease processes lead a patient uh, to need a shoulder arthroplasty? The usual disease is osteoarthritis of the shoulder, sometimes called OA for short. And this is a condition of wear and tear of the joint inside the joint. Your shoulder is normally covered inside with uh, what we call cartilage, and that is a nice smooth sli uh, slidey surface. And that cartilage in osteoarthritis disappears and you start to get bone on bone contact. And that is painful and actually makes noise. So some people get shoulders that creak. So, so osteoarthritis or wear and tear arthritis is the most common cause uh, for a shoulder arthroplasty. Um, do you ever have to perform shoulder arthroplasties for other disease processes, such as fractures of the shoulder or problems with uh, uh, other types of arthritis like rheumatoid arthritis? Yes, uh, rheumatoid arthritis used to be one of the common indications in the UK, but modern drugs have made the need for a shoulder replacement very much less. Uh, so we don't see so many rheumatoid patients now. Uh, we do treat quite a lot of fractures now with shoulder replacements, and the shoulder replacement is usually just the hemiarthroplasty, that's half the joint, uh, we replace the ball of the joint and use the stem of the artificial joint to help splint the fracture. Now, could, let's move on a little bit and talk a, a bit about the area of the body that we're really talking about and some of the anatomy of the shoulder. Can you describe, when we're talking about the shoulder joint, what, what parts of the body are we talking about? Well, we're looking at the uh, whole of the shoulder area, but the shoulder comprises four different joints. You've got the ball and socket joint inside the shoulder, which is the one that we are talking about replacing. You've also got a joint up at, above the shoulder between the collarbone and the point of the shoulder that we call the AC joint. And then we've got at the inner side a joint where the collarbone articulates with the breastbone. And then underneath the shoulder blade, there is a joint between the shoulder blade and the chest. And that's actually quite an important joint. That's a sliding joint where the shoulder blade slides over the chest wall. Many people don't appreciate that when you move your shoulder, a third of the movement is actually shoulder blade movement and not shoulder joint movement. Two thirds is shoulder joint movement. So the combination when you lift your arm up is usually a third shoulder blade on the chest wall and two thirds movement at the true shoulder joint. Now if I'm a patient and I'm developing osteoarthritis or any type of arthritis of the shoulder that, that may need an artificial joint replacement of the shoulder, what sort of symptoms am I looking for? What sort of symptoms bring patients into your office? Well, patients start to get pain in the region of the upper arm and they get confused because the pain is felt in this area here below the shoulder rather than in the true shoulder itself. And this is what we call referred pain. So the pain is being felt in a different place from where the problem is. And the arthritis inside the joint gives pain initially in the upper arm and then as the arthritis becomes more severe, it moves down the arm into the forearm. And this can be very confusing for patients who can't understand why they've got arm pain when actually it, it's a shoulder problem. 
The other thing that alerts them to the fact that this is getting worse is that they start to get night pain and they, their sleep is disturbed at night. But if they lie perfectly still, they can usually avoid having too much discomfort. Now let's talk a little bit about treatment other than surgery. Uh, when, when you're treating patients who have osteoarthritis of the shoulder or one of these other arthritis problems, mostly wear and tear arthritis of the shoulder, what sort of treatments are you going to recommend prior to surgery before you, you consider going ahead and doing a shoulder replacement? Initially, uh, we recommend uh, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Uh, the, the sort of drugs that we use are ibuprofen, um, which you take orally, and that reduces the inflammation and the pain a little. Um, we don't, however, like patients to be forced into taking these drugs long term because they do occasionally upset the stomach and you've got to be careful of that. We modify their activities and if, for instance, your shoulder is getting painful initially from a sporting activity, playing tennis uh, or doing um, lifting above shoulder level, then we may simply modify activities uh, in order to make the patient more comfortable. However, as the condition progresses, this limitation becomes intrusive. And once you get to the stage of having night pain, that's the time when you really have to start thinking about whether you need uh, a shoulder replacement operation. Now, do you rely on any sort of injections? Are, are you a believer in cortisone injections for this disease process, physical therapy as a treatment for osteoarthritis of the shoulder? Do you feel like that's beneficial at all? I do try physiotherapy. Uh, sometimes patients develop a degree of shoulder stiffness with their osteoarthritis, and if you can stretch it out, they improve significantly. I also do use uh, steroid injections into the shoulder, but my experience has been that if you inject the shoulder with steroids, you get good pain relief for about six to eight weeks, but then the pain comes back again, and sometimes it can come back worse than it was before you injected the shoulder. So it's, it's not a, a way of solving the problem. When you sit down and have a discussion with a patient who's trying to decide whether it's time to consider an artificial shoulder replacement, what are the keys that you use to determine whether or not to recommend surgery for that patient? I think it's important for me to understand and get to know the patient quite well. I need to know what activities the patient does, what, what they get up to at home, I need to know whether their medical conditions, if they have any, are serious. One of my reasons for not offering a shoulder replacement in some patients is if they are falling regularly. Um, as you can appreciate, as you get older, you tend to fall a little bit. But if you are falling once or twice a week, then if we were to do a shoulder replacement, there is a risk of a nasty fracture occurring in the region of the shoulder replacement and that can be difficult to manage. However, if you focus with the patient on what they want out of their life, if the arthritis is intrusive, if it's stopping them doing things they want to do, then that is the time to consider doing a shoulder replacement. The shoulder is a little different from the knee and the hip. If you have arthritis of one knee or one hip, you limp because you have to use both legs to walk. When you have a painful shoulder, you can actually get off by putting your hand in your pocket and using your other arm. So many patients actually put up with their shoulder pain for much longer than they would put up with their hip or knee pain because they just reduce how much they use it. But if after a period they can no longer do the things they want to do, and that may be household activities, it may be sports, then that is a time for you to discuss with them would they like to consider a shoulder replacement 
and then explain to them the pros and cons of having that operation. Let's talk a little bit about what you're trying to achieve as a surgeon. What's, what's the purpose, what's the rationale of a shoulder arthroplasty uh, in your mind as a surgeon? Well, the main indication, uh, Randy, is pain. Um, that is the best indication for doing a shoulder replacement. Treatment of osteoarthritic pain with a shoulder replacement is very effective. And I am quite happy to tell my patients that the chance of giving them pain relief so that they're content after a shoulder replacement for osteoarthritis is around 90%. The real problem is getting movement back again after a shoulder replacement. And that depends on two things. It depends on how well I do the shoulder replacement and it depends on how well the patient does their physiotherapy and rehabilitation after the operation. I can do a brilliant operation, but if the patient doesn't do their physiotherapy afterwards, they will land up with a shoulder that doesn't move so well and they may struggle to get their arm up to and above shoulder level. But if they're a good patient and they exercise conscientiously after the operation and later go to the gym, then we can usually get near normal movement back into the shoulder. Let's talk a little bit now about preparation for surgery. Once you and the patient have decide, decided that that you're going to go forward with a, a shoulder arthroplasty, what do you like to see as a physician for that patient uh, to be evaluated? What sort of things do you request of the patient uh, uh, before you, you, you finalize the date for the operation? Well, we get them to meet the physiotherapist uh, well before the operation. They're given pre-operative exercises to try and ensure that they've got as much movement as possible from this arthritic shoulder before we take them to the uh, OR. We um, explain to them that there is going to be a need to uh, attend physiotherapy sessions and do home exercises and we've prepared a brochure that uh, guides them uh, about what is needed. Now when you're doing this preoperative evaluation. Do patients need to worry about their medical status? Do you routinely have them meet with anesthesiologist or their medical physician to get clearance before surgery? It depends on the patient and their general fitness. As a rough guide, I'm a very simple orthopedic surgeon. If a patient is on no tablets, no medication, and they can climb a flight of stairs, they're fit for an operation. But if they're on multiple medications, if they're breathless when they exercise, um, if they have significant medical problems like diabetes or heart disease, then we do get them checked out medically and the anesthesiologist will see them before their operation and check whether they are uh, fit for the operation. One of the things we do see is patients are awful eager to have their operation and they may uh, get a, a, a cold or a bit of flu-like symptoms and uh, we never operate on a planned operating list a patient who has a cold or flu-like symptoms because they can get pneumonia afterwards and we don't want that to happen. So we put it off for uh, three, four weeks make sure that they're ideally fit for the procedure. So if a patient is having any sort of problems in terms of um, infections, sore throat, any skin infections, or any problems with respiratory infections, such as a cold or perhaps bronchitis, you would opt for allowing them to get over that um, illness before they went through with an operation? Very much so. Um, and, and I know that's frustrating for the patient because they will have made plans for their operation. They may have got family members to take time off, but uh, their health is uh, paramount. Uh, I think things have changed just a little bit uh, with the use of uh, what we call nerve blocks because we are doing this surgery now with the patients awake. Um, the anesthesiologist will give an injection into the neck and that will freeze and paralyze the whole arm 
and we are doing joint replacements in that situation. Um, if that is the way we do the joint replacement, uh, the chest is less of a problem because you're not giving an anaesthetic that is inhaled. But it's still an issue and you really do want to have your patient fighting fit for any operation. Well, let's talk a little bit about the anesthesia and, and what that means. Um, do you still use general anesthetic where you put a patient completely to sleep or have you gone exclusively to using what you refer to as regional anesthetics where you uh, do a block of sorts that paralyzes and numbs the arm so that you don't uh, feel the operation but you're still actually awake? Uh, it's really half and half um, in that uh, we, that is the anesthesiologist, discusses with the patient what they want. A lot of patients don't want to be awake and they would prefer to be asleep for the operation. Some find it quite uh, exciting to be awake for the operation. What I can assure patients is that we only operate when the um, block, when the nerve block is completely effective and it is sometimes necessary to convert from a nerve block to giving a general anesthetic uh, if there's any discomfort. But nowadays our anesthesiologists are very, very good at carrying out these nerve blocks. And uh, for us it's quite interesting because we can chat to the patient during the operation. Now, the operation itself, uh, does a patient come into the hospital the same day of the operation? Uh, is a patient admitted the night before the operation? Uh, how is it done in your hospital? Normally the patient comes in 7 o'clock on the morning of the operation uh, and the OR list will start uh, at 8.30. Uh, we have an all-day list. Uh, the exception to this is patients who come from a long distance. I, I provide a regional and uh, a, a bit of a national uh, joint replacement service in Nottingham and uh, patients travel long distances up to five hours by car uh, to come to the hospital and in that situation we have a patient to tell that they stay in overnight prior to the operation uh, and then come down to the operating theatre from the patient to tell for surgery. Now the operation itself when when the patient uh, uh, goes through this operation how long does it normally take the operation itself? Um, you've got to divide it up into anesthesia time, then the operation proper, and then the recovery time. The anesthesia time, that is putting the block in or giving the general anesthetic or both, probably about half an hour. The operating time, we allow about an hour and a half, and the recovery time is about half an hour. So all in all, they're going to be down in the OR for a period of between two and a half and three hours. And then the patients return to the floor, the, uh, the ward, so to speak, where they will do their recovery for the next several days in the hospital? That's right. And depending on the fitness of the patient, uh, they may get home after 48 hours. But if they're elderly, uh, a little bit infirm, they may stay with us for three or uh, nowadays a maximum of about four days. Now, in the, in the post-operative period, what should I expect if I'm a patient afterwards? Uh, in terms of how much pain do, should I expect? Am I going to get any sort of IVs or anything else while I'm in the hospital? What, what goes on immediately after the operation? You will find that you're, you have an IV, an intravenous infusion up so that drugs can be given. Uh, if you've had a block, a nerve block for the operation, you will have absolutely no pain for the first 18 hours. Uh, it's very effective. The, the, the problem, and it is a problem, is that the block tends to wear off at night, uh, often when you're going to sleep or when you are asleep, and then you wake up with some pain, so that we encourage our nurses to give medication, painkilling medication, to the patients 10 o'clock at night before they go to sleep and make sure they have a decent dose of that uh, so that that ad addresses the problem that they will have uh, when the block does wear off. After about 20, 24 hours, uh, the 
pain has subsided significantly and uh, a number of patients tell me my pain is gone I don't have arthritic pain anymore I got some bruising some soreness from the operation um, and the only time they have pain is when the nasty old physiotherapist starts having a go at them and getting them moving and then they do have to work through the discomfort of getting that shoulder moving in the first few days after the operation. Now when when do you start physical therapy? Is that started on the same day as the operation? The next day? When should I expect a, a physical therapist to show up in my room? Well the uh, physical therapist will have, seen, will have seen the patient before they go down to the OR uh, we usually do not start physiotherapy the same day uh, and that is because with the nerve block the patient can't do much with their arm and it's much better that the patient is actually taking part in the physiotherapy uh, exercise. So the following day when the block has worn off from 9 o'clock in the morning they will start their physiotherapy and the physiotherapist will take them through the exercises. We do use a broad arm sling, a shoulder immobilizer, after the operation, but really only for 48 hours until the patient has a good control back in their arm. And then, quite honestly, the immobilizer is only used when the patient is out of doors or taking long walks. The rest of the time, we prefer to dispense with the uh, immobilizer and get the shoulder going. Now, I think a lot of patients are, are sometimes concerned whether with, when they have a major operation like an artificial shoulder replacement, whether or not they'll need a blood transfusion. Is this a common occurrence when, when, when a patient has an artificial shoulder replacement that uh, a blood replacement is required, a blood transfusion uh, in the postoperative period? We uh, no longer use blood transfusion uh, in 99% of our patients. Uh, you might have an occasional patient with a bleeding problem. Uh, it's very rare and uh, I can't remember the last time that I actually transfused a, a patient for a shoulder replacement operation. It's a combination of uh, good surgery, stopping the bleeding, the use of appropriate uh, drugs to help us uh, control the bleeding and uh, so blood transfusion is not really necessary but you do have to as a surgeon warn the patient that occasionally something goes wrong occasionally you do have a bleeding episode afterwards and therefore perhaps uh, one case in 50 or one case in 100 you might need a blood transfusion but very rarely well let's move on and talk a little bit about about how patients recover after a shoulder arthroplasty. I think you mentioned that one is, is they begin physical therapy fairly quickly. They've been given some instructions prior to surgery so they know what they're going to be expected to do after surgery. They start physical therapy probably while they're in the hospital. And I think what you've said is that the patients generally leave anywhere from 48 hours after the procedure to maybe five or six days after the procedure, depending on their general health status and ability to get around. So what happens at that point? Uh, how fast am I going to be able to get back to using my shoulder in what I would consider a normal fashion? Well, I usually tell uh, patients who are working that they should be looking at returning to uh, clerical type work about four weeks after the operation. Between discharge from hospital and that four weeks, they will do a lot of home exercises. They start off uh, in hospital doing pendulum exercises and what we call pulley exercises. And when they go home, they are provided with a pulley that clamps over the top of a door and allows them to pull their arm up and down like that on the pulley in order to uh, get the maximum movement out of the shoulder and actually on the pulley they get all the way up to there using their good arm to pull their bad arm and that's a very good exercise to get the movement back into the shoulder. Once they get to four weeks we encourage them to go swimming in a warm swimming pool because that is one of the really good ways of getting your maximum movement back again. And the physiotherapist is there 
to ensure that they are doing their home exercises. But quite honestly, the physiotherapist shouldn't be doing an awful lot of physiotherapy themselves on the patient. It's the patient doing it for themselves. Now, let's talk a little bit about shoulder arthroplasties and the results of shoulder arthroplasty. What's your experience been in terms of the longevity of a, of a shoulder arthroplasty? You know, th th as I understand it, an artificial shoulder is not a weight-bearing joint such as the hip and the knee, so that the wear problems that we have with weight-bearing aren't quite as much of a problem with the shoulders. How have you seen shoulder arthroplasties function after the surgery is over and after the patient has pretty much healed up from the operation? Well, the trick is to get good movement early on, and if you get that, you're on to a winner. Um, the survival uh, is now quite good, and I tell my patients that the failure rate from a shoulder replacement, once you've got beyond the first uh, six months, is about 1% a year. That means you get to 10 years and 10% have required a revision operation. As far as the wear is concerned, that depends on how much you do with the shoulder. If you're 70 and I put in a total shoulder replacement, both the ball and the socket, I'm going to expect that to last you your lifetime. But I saw a lady in my clinic yesterday who I put a shoulder replacement in uh, 14 years ago. She's been very active, playing sports, doing all sorts of things, and the socket on the side that was put in 14 years ago has worn, and I am going to have to do a revision operation on her. Um, but we're not seeing a need to do a lot of revision operations. It does seem that these joints are surviving long term and doing very well. And what can you expect in terms of range of motion after an artificial uh, uh, shoulder replacement and, and the strength uh, that you can, you, you know, the strength that you have in the arm so that you can use that arm for normal activities? Do you restrict these patients in any way? Uh, I stop them uh, parachuting, uh, jumping out of a plane, but that's about the, as much as I limit uh, their activities. I believe my role as an orthopedic shoulder surgeon is to give the patient back a shoulder that they can use for the things they want to do. Um, uh, I would emphasize that there is a big difference in the results of movement depending on the pathology, that is the disease condition that the patient has. Osteoarthritis generally results in a very good functioning shoulder and I'd expect to be able to get up to at least 140 degrees, that's that position. And for some of my patients, they are getting full elevation. They're getting their arm right up in the air. After a shoulder replacement, we aim to try and get as good a shoulder as possible. And you asked me about whether the shoulder uh, is weaker afterwards, and the answer is yes it is. In general, patients who have shoulder replacements have lost about a third of the strength in that shoulder compared with a normal shoulder. I'm not sure why that occurs, but we measure the strength in the shoulder using a um, strength gauge and measuring the pounds that you can lift and we typically see the normal shoulder lifting 25 pounds, but the replaced shoulder lifting 12 or 15 pounds in a shoulder that has a good result. So we do see a less good strength, but usually the patients don't recognize that it is weak. The other thing I wanted to mention was uh, sport. Returning to sport after a shoulder replacement is something many people want to do. And personally, I like to get them back as soon as it's safe to do so. People want to go back to play golf. If you're a good golfer and you don't hit divots out of the grass, I'm very comfortable with you going back at three months. If you're a bad golfer, back at four months. I do return people to playing tennis, playing badminton, these sort of racket sports. After all, 
they have had an operation to make their shoulder better. I do that to allow them to return to what they want to do. And sport is something that a lot of people want to do into their 70s and 80s now. And my responsibility as a surgeon is to deliver that service for the patient. But after a fracture, it may not be possible with a shoulder replacement to get back to that sort of condition of racket sports, but you should be able to get back to golf okay. We also talked a little bit about wear and how long these prostheses uh, will last a patient. Can you elaborate on that a little bit in terms of how long you feel like a shoulder replacement will last in an atypical patient? It does depend on how active the patient is, but if you're putting your shoulder replacement into a 70-year-old, then they are usually not active, so active that they're going to wear that shoulder out. That shoulder is usually going to last the rest of their lives. If, however, you have to put a shoulder replacement into, for instance, um, a 30-year-old, then you are talking about somebody who is going to be using that shoulder normally for many years, and we would be looking at a shoulder that would last perhaps 15 to 20 years, and we would expect it to undergo significant wear during that period and probably require revision surgery. So I do always tell the younger patients that they should expect to have a revision operation uh, sometime in the future if I put it into somebody between the ages of 30 and 50. Professor Wallace, what we should do now, I think, is talk about some things that, that both patients and surgeons sometimes don't like to hear, and that's what could go wrong with this operation. Not only during the operation, but perhaps immediately after the operation, and then down the line, you know, years sometimes down the line, what is it that you worry about as an orthopedic surgeon? So, so let's start with first, what are you worried about during the operation that might go wrong? Mm -hmm. During the operation, it's very important for me to get the bits of the shoulder replacement in exactly the right place. The ball has to be where the original ball was. The socket has to be where the original socket was. And that's actually difficult in some patients who've got a lot of joint damage. But let's assume we've managed to get it into a near perfect position. It's very important to reconstruct the tendons around the shoulder called the rotator cuff tendons because they are the bits that make the shoulder move afterwards. Now in some rheumatoid patients, the tendons and the muscles are in poor condition. And that is one reason why rheumatoid patients after shoulder replacement often don't get full movement back and often are only uh, able to get up to shoulder level, to about there. You are very dependent on these muscles called the rotator cuff muscles and tendons working effectively after the operation. So I concentrate on getting them right. I then close the wound, we are able to produce very satisfactory cosmetic scars, but it is a scar, and for ladies, um, they are particularly sensitive about the scar and they want it to look as smart as possible, and we tend to use what we call subcuticular sutures so that there's no suture marks um, when the stitches come out. The one thing that we really worry about as surgeons is getting an infection in that shoulder. We've now got the infection rate down to about 1% for an osteoarthritic shoulder. That means one person in a hundred is going to get an infection. And it doesn't matter how hard we try, that complication is going to occur. And I warn every patient about this, even although it's a low-risk complication, because if it happens to that particular patient, then they will have to come back to the OR for further surgery. They may have to have the joint taken out and revised. But if we are forced into doing that, we can usually land up at the end of the revision procedure with a shoulder which is still better 
than the original problem with the shoulder with arthritis. Well, that's good news. And, and what about the risk of bleeding, the risk of damage to the blood vessels or the nerves around the shoulders? Is this something that is a, a, a serious risk or is this something that's, that's very unlikely? Bleeding, uh, I suppose I see uh, bruising, uh, more bruising than normal in about uh, one patient in 10, uh, but not enough to worry me. It does worry the patients because they see this bruising going down the arm um, and uh, it's more painful when you have that, uh, that bruising. Uh, nerve injury again is something that we have to warn the patients about. There are three nerves very close to the shoulder and all three nerves can be injured at a shoulder replacement operation by traction, that is pulling on the nerves. The nerves which are at risk are the uh, axillary nerve and that's a nerve that supplies the deltoid muscle, this muscle here, and if that is temporarily paralyzed the patient can't lift their arm. The second nerve is the muscular cutaneous coming down here, that's a nerve that bends the elbow and if that nerve is stretched uh, you can get temporary weakness of bending the elbow. And finally at the back is the radial nerve and that nerve lifts the wrist up so that you, if you have a radial nerve injury, the wrist drops and that can be a traction injury. Fortunately, in the majority of these nerve traction injuries, there is a near normal recovery, but it may take 9 to 12 months. In the rare instance where a surgeon is really worried that the nerve may have been more severely damaged, the surgeon may suggest a re-exploration. But I've only had to do that in my career three times and in two of these occasions I found that the nerve was intact and didn't require any surgery. Well let's talk a little bit about as, as we go down the, the road with, with a shoulder replacement, months to years after the shoulder replacement, what sort of complications can occur uh, at that point? Are there specific complications that you as a surgeon worry about after the, the surgery is healed? There, there are. Um, the first one is the uh, rotator cuff tendons that we talked about earlier. As you get older, these tendons get weaker. And in a shoulder that has been replaced, we do see these tendons sometimes tearing uh, five, ten years after surgery and the patient knows something's gone wrong because they've had a good shoulder and then suddenly they feel a pain, uh, they can't lift their arm and they have this uh, sensation of weakness uh, in the shoulder and they don't know why it's happened because it happened out of the blue and, and this can be because these tendons have torn spontaneously for, for no obvious reason but the real reason is I'm afraid it's an aging process. Are there any other complications that we haven't talked about that you feel like patients need to know as they go forward in their recuperation and perhaps years after uh, they've, they've recovered from this operation? Well, the shoulder replacement is introduced into the bone and is designed to lock into the bone, either by the bone attaching to the metal stem or the metal socket, or uh, using bone cement. Loosening of the artificial joint is a problem. It does occur any time from insertion all the way up to 20 years after the operation. We think that later on, perhaps after 10 years, loosening does occur in relation to a wear complication, but We've got to make sure the patients realize that loosening can occur. If it occurs, the patients start to get aching pain in their arm usually, sometimes their shoulder but more commonly their arm, and that pain is aggravated by exercise by using the arm. Loosening can also occur as a result of a very low grade infection, 
And so any patient who has loosening, we worry, is the loosening related to an infection or not? The other problem we see with the ball and socket joint in the shoulder is that it's a very shallow socket. It's not like the hip. And therefore the ball is an, in danger of dislocating and coming out of its socket. It's held into the socket by the rotator cuff tendons and the capsule or lining of the inside of the shoulder. And if any of these rotator cuff tendons give way, and particularly the one at the front called the subscapularis tendon, then the shoulder can dislocate forwards. And if that happens and it slips out of joint, then we are talking about corrective surgery to deal with that. Now that risk of dislocation is probably about one case in 30 uh, over the lifetime of 30 uh, shoulder replacement. So it, it does occur, it is significant, um, and it does require corrective surgery. Well, Professor Wallace, this has been an excellent discussion about artificial uh, shoulder replacement. Is there anything that, that you feel like we've not covered that you would like patients to know about artificial shoulder replacement or shoulder arthroplasty that we haven't covered up to this point? Uh, I haven't mentioned up to this point the two designs that are popular. I've mentioned the stemmed shoulder replacement that goes down with the stem going down the inside of the bone, but the surface replacement has become very popular, really popularized by my friend and colleague Steve Copeland, and that is a, a replacement where a metal cup is placed over the ball of the shoulder joint and then acts as a new shoulder joint. And that is proving to be uh, a very good form of shoulder replacement and particularly useful for the younger patient because if you put in the ball and they're maintaining their natural socket and their socket is in good condition, that can last for a large number of years and then if you do have to revise it, it's an easy revision operation. So the surface replacement is an important step that has taken place over the last 10 years and is something that your surgeon may dis discuss with you. Well, that's, that's excellent information. Can you think of anything else we're going to see in the future in terms of shoulder replacement that is perhaps on the horizon that we need to be aware of? Yes, there is a lot of discussion about uh, biological ways of uh, improving a shoulder that is damaged. As I explained earlier on, the inside of the shoulder has a smooth surface. That surface is a cartilage surface and it's an important surface for a normal joint. We are working at producing cartilage which can then be introduced onto the surface of joints to recreate that normal surface. And that is already happening in the knee. The shoulder is more challenging and I think it won't happen this year. It won't happen in five years time, but I suspect in 10 years time, we will have a biological way of dealing with early arthritis of the shoulder and that will mean patients don't have to undergo a shoulder replacement, but can be treated with a less invasive treatment. Well, Professor Wallace, this has been a wonderful discussion, and I think that it's useful information for all patients who are facing uh, problems with their shoulder, such as osteoarthritis of the shoulder, and are considering an artificial shoulder replacement or a shoulder arthroplasty, as it's otherwise known as. So I want to thank you for joining us today. Thank you for sharing this information with patients and uh, hope to talk to you again soon. Thank you very much. It's been my pleasure, Dr. Seacrest. Uh, I'm very grateful for the opportunity of helping patients understand their problems a little more because if they understand, we can work as a team and get a better result at the end of the day.